authority. Yes, but whose? The teaching authority of the church, its magisterium, is experiencing hard times. Most Catholics today haven't been taught the doctrines of the faith in home, school or church. And what you don't know and don't know you don't know can't hurt you, can it? Wrong. Not knowing the doctrines of the faith means you can't live, worship and grow in it. And finally, you can't die in it, which has terrible and everlasting implications. Given the widespread ignorance, even among Catholics, about the most basic Christian teachings, it's no wonder the world and the church is in a lamentable state of moral and spiritual poverty and decay. But leaving aside this pandemic of faithlessness, there are worrying things about the attitudes and values of those Catholics who practice the faith, who pride themselves on being enlightened in the faith. There's the pride, arrogance and independence that induces us to make for ourselves religious theories and interpretations about the Catholic faith that are quite alien to official church teaching. That's the material of heresy. Teaching, governing and sanctifying is what the church is there to do. And these three roles are vitally interactive and interdependent. Without teaching us, the church has little chance of governing us and an ungoverned people is not going to be sanctified. So for the sake of our souls, it pays us all to have some clarity about the church's teaching, where it comes from, what it consists of, and what it demands of us. The church's teaching is Christ's teaching. It comes from Christ himself, filtered to us through the church's magisterium or teaching authority. It consists of truths revealed in scripture and tradition, that is, other truths handed down through the ages from the church fathers and orthodox writers from the early church centuries of the church. This body of church doctrine, what we call the deposit of faith, has Christ's guarantee behind it. It is always true, no ifs or buts. Nowadays, the truths of the faith don't hit people between the eyes. Many of us don't hear them from the pulpit, Children don't generally encounter them in school. The best families don't always teach them. Even if we were motivated to hunt them down for ourselves, which many of us are not, due to the distractions of daily life, what we usually find when we press a button or a screen is information ranging from outright falsehood to the latest personal take on the faith by some self-styled apologist. Some people take their doctrinal cues from their favourite private revelation. This is a big temptation when holy information is rather hard to come by in our secularised world. But it is a serious error to confuse sacred revelation, which is always true, with private messages to and by seers and visionaries, however holy they may be and however well approved by the church. All these practices feed into the present massive tendency towards individualism and relativism in everything, including religious belief. These philosophies induce us to shape our own personal belief system and hang our right to do so on the convenient idea that everyone is entitled to their own truth. This does away with the normal, true definition of truth. And it does away with anyone's need to access objective truth the sky being the limit to what you can believe or teach or act on, a recipe for chaos socially and personally. The church has always provided the antidote to all this. Christ has equipped the church with that wonderful gift called infallibility, inbuilt protection against error in faith and morals, supplied from his own infallibility. But here we come up against a few more misunderstandings. We often talk about infallible teachings, but properly speaking, we should refer to these church doctrines as infallibly taught. That means that it's the people who are infallible in their believing or teaching of the faith. It also means that the doctrines they believe and teach are not of their own making. These exist already, of course, because they come from God, revealing himself to us directly or indirectly and they don't change for the same reason. 
So infallibility is God's guarantee that what the church teaches, and we in believing it, can never be wrong. Faced with this proposition, most people are incredulous. It sounds grossly over-optimistic, to say the least, especially the bit about our belief never being wrong. But this is where we need to get into the fine print. There are some key distinctions to be made. Infallibility in belief. The whole people of God, insofar as they believe the doctrines of the church, can't go off the rails faith-wise. They have what is called the sensus fidei, which is infallibility in belief. Infallibility in teaching. The bishops, as a unified body in union with the Pope, can teach infallibly. The Pope, in his office as the successor to St. Peter, in union with no one, has the power to teach infallibly. But there are limits on all of these forms of infallibility. They're all bound by the condition that the persons concerned believe and teach existing Catholic doctrine. None of them exercises infallibility outside it. No one is able to peddle their own doctrinal wares or introduce new doctrines. Papal infallibility, how far does it go? People, especially badly instructed Catholics and Protestants, are very threatened by the Church's claims for papal infallibility. Those of other religions, or atheists, possibly don't give the Pope a second thought, or simply think Catholics hopelessly gullible fools to follow him at all. Ignorant Catholics and Protestants are bothered by the teaching power of the Pope thinking that every quirky idea he has, every policy he adopts, or every unpopular direction he takes is binding on all Catholics. Protestants use this as a sign that they did right in cutting loose from Catholicism. Ignorant Catholics either use it to justify their decision to leave the church, or, if they are very one-eyed fundamentalists or ultramontanists, may take it on board blindly and without nuance. Most of them don't realise that the Pope's infallibility, while real and incontestable, has limits. He is not infallible as a person, or as an individual believer, or even as a private teacher or theologian. His infallibility only pertains to his position as universal teacher of the faith. So papal opinions or preferences can't be considered as part of his infallibility, even when they are in line with Catholic teaching. And unfortunately, as we all know, they're not always so. He is infallible only when acting as universal teacher and judge, he solemnly proclaims some doctrine in faith or morals, not new, but needing special emphasis or clarification. This is an exercise of his extraordinary magisterium. Infallibility of the bishops. Bishops are not individually infallible, but in ecumenical councils, their solemn definitions of doctrine ratified by the Pope are infallible signs that God has enlightened his church. They can also act to define doctrine infallibly, even when they're dispersed throughout the world, but in unison and in union with the Pope. The thing to bear in mind is that regardless of the levels of infallibility wielded by Pope or bishops, the Church's doctrines are all true and always true, and we find them in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is where we can access the truth about God, about us, about the world. Some Catholics don't bother to read the Catechism, thinking it to be just too lengthy or dense. Some don't know it exists. Some of a traditionalist bent are suspicious of its orthodoxy because it is a formulation of the faith coming out of a post-conciliar church. All are misguided and, unless inculpably ignorant, are in danger of courting heresy. In 1998, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith promulgated a document setting out the new formulation of a profession of faith to be required of all who hold certain offices within the church bishops, seminary staff, and so on. This profession of faith 
which begins with the Nicene Creed, includes three key paragraphs which outline the levels of authority behind the various kinds of church teaching and the relative demands to which the believer commits himself. The then Cardinal Ratzinger attached an explanation of each of these levels, explanations that are a must-know for every conscientious Catholic. What sorts of teaching belong to these levels of authority? The first level, dogmas. These are the truths which the magisterium teaches infallibly as the matter of revelation, scripture and tradition. They may be taught by the Pope, by an ecumenical council, or by the church's ordinary and universal magisterium. Quote, These teachings require the assent of theological faith by all the faithful, and whoever obstinately places them in doubt or denies them falls under the censure of heresy, end quote, from the CDF document. Dogmas include all the articles of the faith of the creed. Dogmas about Christ and Our Lady, the sacraments, the Eucharist, the Church, the infallibility of the Pope, the truth of the Scriptures, original sin, the immortality of the soul, the immorality of killing an innocent human being, and so on, and, surprise, surprise, the superiority of virginity over marriage. The second level. These teachings are a step below dogmas in that they're not themselves divinely revealed, but are connected with divine revelation. They are, however, infallibly taught by the Church's magisterium. And, quote, whoever denies these truths would be in a position of rejecting a truth of Catholic doctrine and would therefore no longer be in full communion with the Catholic Church. End quote from the CDF document. These include the definitive doctrine that priestly ordination is reserved to men only, the doctrine on the evil of euthanasia based on the natural law and on the written law of God, the legitimacy of a papal election, the canonization of saints. The third level. These include teachings on faith or morals which are presented as true or at least sure. They're set forth in order to arrive at a deeper understanding of revelation or to warn against ideas incompatible with the truths of faith. Beliefs held against these teachings are regarded as erroneous and dangerous. It's possible to gauge the importance of these teachings by looking at the importance of the documents in which these topics feature, the tone of expression used by the Pope or bishops, and the frequency with which they are given. Note, the teachings of Vatican II are on this level unless they're a reaffirmation of the teachings from levels one or two. The fourth level. This involves other statements, which may be included in documents by the magisterium, such as theological opinions, which are not strictly doctrinal, but compatible with doctrine, or descriptions of a state of society, suggestions, exhortations, and so on. We are entitled to disagree with these, although they should normally be received with respect and gratitude. Some examples of these are certain passages in the documents of councils, for example Vatican II, which are more in the line of commentaries and exhortations than teachings. They should not be evaluated, as they too often are, as dogmatic assertions, either to defend or to reject them. Knowing about these various levels of church teaching and their relative weighting enables us to steer our life and thinking along a faithful course. It enables us to have discussions in the church that lead to truth and not to more mindless faction warfare. Knowing what the church teaches, why she teaches, with what authority she teaches, all of this is key to a true ecclesiology by which we are able to think with the church, defend her against her critics and enemies, lurking both within and without, and move intelligently in the direction of salvation. <laughs>